Hello, everybody. So this talk is about uh, uh, a sort of framework that we created. Um, we started about uh, three years ago, uh, which is called Polycube. And the problem that we were facing at the time was that uh, in the traditional networking world, we're uh, used to work with, let's say, middle boxes. So like uh, we create, uh, we have a bridge, uh, we connect to a router, then we connect to a NAT, and then a firewall, and then to a DNS. While uh, in the virtual uh, world that we are used uh, in the recent years, this model is not that clear. And uh, what we would like to do is to try to recreate exactly the same model, of course, where uh, physical machines are now virtual machines, but then where the virtual machines can be connected to a bridge and then a router and a NAT and so on. And this was not that easy right now. So our software framework, Polycube, brings the well-known paradigm used in the traditional world like uh, boxes, ports, and links that connect between port and boxes in the Linux virtualized world in order uh, to recreate in Linux the same familiar environment that we're used to in the physical world. Of course, we don't want to give up on uh, efficiency. And that's the reason we choose the eBPF in kernel processes. So given this high level goal, let's say long term goal, the path to Polycube has been, um, has been determined trying to solve the following problems. First, I think that many people uh, try to create a network service with eBPF and they recognize that in the end it's not that simple. And the reason is that network services are not just data plane. Why? I mean, eBPF is very strong in data plane processing. Second, when you want to create a complex network service, you have to handle network topologies. So it's not just a matter of creating a very powerful load balancer or a very powerful router. You have to create many services and chain them together. And this is not some, something that is so simple in virtualized environment. Third, when we create a network service, can we simplify the life of the developer of the service itself, so that the developer can concentrate on the high-level logic of its service, if it is a router, maybe a routing protocols and the forwarding, but let's say, let's avoid all the ancillary tasks that are often needed in, in uh, this world and that can bring you a lot of time. And uh, this is not really something that you would like to spend time on, on that. Basically, also thinking about the VPF, hiding difference between TC and XDP is very important because your service can be uh, executed at different points in the networking stack. For a similar reason, we would like to simplify the life of network admins. So the guy who runs the service, who deploys the router, the bridge, and the NAS in order to create and control its network topology. And finally, we don't want to give up on performance uh, and we would like to leverage the best of the Linux ecosystem. So we don't want to reinvent everything from scratch. So those are basically the questions, the more detailed questions that we try to answer when we create Polycube, we started about three years ago. So let's try to see how this uh, framework, software framework works uh, splitting this presentation in, let's say, six different objectives. The first objective is we try to create a common structure and abstraction for network function, which means that definitely network function are usually made in three components. The first is the data plane. The data plane is very important, is in charge of forwarding packets. But if you go a little bit deeper, all the network devices have two kinds of data planning. First, the fast path, which is in charge of most of the packets. So the packets are coming, the fast path is doing something to the packets and sending them out. 
like forwarding in a router. And then there is usually a slow path component which is in charge of the tasks which are still data paths, but that do not happen often. Like, uh, for instance, I would like to handle ARP requests. Okay, this is something that has to be done in your router, but it doesn't happen so often. If we move that logic in the slow path, we can create a much slimmer fast path, which means it's much faster but still we have the possibility to handle that traffic in the slow path uh, because uh, uh, it's really needed. In case of eBPF, we have one more reason for uh, uh, having this slow path. The fact that the, the fast path, so the internal processing is not uh, um, complete. So we cannot do whatever we want in the fast path because we know eBPF has some well-known limitations. So in our case, the slow path is created in user space, is not related to eBPF, and you can do there anything you want. So you are not longer limited by the uh, limitation of the eBPF. So that's the reason, one more reason for which we have the slow path. And then, of course, control and management plan. So all the algorithms in order to control, like, uh, uh, control the routing protocols or to show statistics or configure your service are here in the control and management plane. Also running user space, so you, are, you don't have any limitation related to eBPF. The programmer that creates this service has to concentrate on these three boxes, slow path, fast path, and control and management and all the interaction between all those components are handled by the Polycube framework automatically. You have just to say, send this packet to the slow path, and that's it. By magic, the packet comes on the slow path, and so on. So all the glue logic made together by Polycube. Second, service function chaining. So let's see the service function chaining from the perspective of the user, the final user. So let's imagine we have a Linux server with three virtual machines or something like that and a network card. And we would like to create a network service in between. So what can we do? Okay, let's connect to a bridge. So let's create first a bridge. Okay, and this is the command line. Polycube CTL is our command line interface, which is used to create the bridge. And then you create a port on a bridge. This port here, and then you connect this port to a virtual machine. And then, of course, you create a second port, connect to the second virtual machine, third port, and then connect to the third virtual machine. And finally, you create a fourth port to a router. But right now, you cannot connect to the router because the router doesn't exist yet. So let's create a router. Okay, create it. Now let's create the first port to the router toward the bridge. Let's connect to the bridge. Let's create a second port to the router. Let's connect to the NIT. And that's it. I'm cheating a little bit because the router has to be configured. So we have to configure the routing table and so on. But still, you can see the power of service function chaining in Polycube. You can create, connect ports, devices, and uh, network function together pretty easily with the same command line interface. This is not possible in the traditional eBPF world. I mean, it's not that simple. So what, how can we do this? Uh, so what we do is that once we create a bridge or a router in the kernel, when you create those, in fact, we create always some additional preprocessor and post-processor programs toward associated to each uh, one of the network functions. And those preprocessor and post-processors are just there in order to simplify the connection between one uh, program to the other. So the bridge, the eBPF bridge and the eBPF router so that you can link the program together. And this allows, uh, enables the command line interface as simple as uh, we said before. For the same reason, we have to create additional programs 
associated to the input and output devices in order to allow this kind of uh, very flexible chaining. And of course, uh, we have to create some helpers to be used within each uh, one of the EBPF program in order to allow the, the packet to be sent to the next uh, block in the chain, which can be another EBPF program or a physical virtual interface. And so that this uh, helper doesn't change, I mean, the, it changes the behavior, but it doesn't change from the user perspective, the programmer perspective that says, okay, I'm done, that push the packet out and whatever out it is. Of course, those preprocessor and post-processor may introduce a little bit of overhead, but we can see the overhead later in a slide. Third objective, single point of control. So from the user perspective, I would like to control all my network and all my services from a single point. So what we did is we created a demo called the Polycube D that is handling the entire life cycle of all your virtual network, which means two different things. First, has to take care of uh, topology related tasks. So it has to create a device, create another network function, connect them together and so on. So creating the topology of your network service. And then service related tasks, because once you create the router, maybe you have to configure IP addresses in the router, or maybe you have to show the statistics of the filtering database on the bridge and so on. So you have to configure and inspect everything from the same demon from the same point of control of your entire virtual network. But what does it mean service? Which are the service? Right now we have the router, we have the switch, but what about if we wanna create our own service? Do we have to modify Polycube D? Do we have to modify the command line interface in order to add a new service into Polycube? So we thought about this and we decided that we have to implement a model-driven service abstraction. What does it mean? It means that we can add a new service, a new network function without changing that much about the framework. The key technology here is that each network function has to be associated to a young data model. Young is a language that is becoming extremely common in networking in order to abstract the, let's say, configuration, so the structure, the syntax, and the semantic of the configuration data. So basically, you can change and configure a network service by just setting a variable, deleting a structure, or adding a new record in a list or something like that. So it's a, a sort of abstract form, okay? So we take this young data model and we brought a, a piece of uh, uh, tools, some tools automatic that are able to generate automatically the code. And those tools are automatically uh, creating the common line interface. So if you develop a new network service like a, your powerful, much better router, you don't have to write anything about uh, uh, the command line interface for your router, because once you brought the young data model, the command line interface is automatically generated for you. And the same happens for the REST API, because you know the command line interface is very nice for computers, but it's not that, sorry, very nice for humans, but it's not so nice for computers. So of course we have a REST API where you can control all your network topology and so on. By the way, Polycube D is a REST API. Also, the REST API is automatically created. And finally, the automatic code generation tool are creating some service-specific source code. So they are creating the files that you can include in your service and that perform already validation of your input and all that stuff that is required in order for your uh, service to work, but it's really annoying to be written manually by a user program. So young model is the key part here. Objective five, this is something uh, a little bit strange, code reloading. What does it mean code reloading? Let's start with an example. 
Let's imagine we have a firewall, okay? So we have a firewall, we create this firewall and the firewall control plane instantiate the firewall. Okay, very simple. And then the user says, okay, you firewall, you have to drop traffic from this address. You know, this is a very simple uh, action. So it's enough to inspect the uh, source IP of the, of the packet. And then if it matches, you can drop the packet and that's it. So the code that you can inject in this firewall that satisfies this action is pretty small. Now let's imagine that now the user says, okay, let's add a new rule. You have to enable also uh, established sessions. So uh, allow people from inside to go to the internet and get the answer, but not uh, the, the reverse. So connection coming from the external world. This is definitely much more complex. So the source code that you have to write in order to satisfy both action is much more complex. So what we do in Polytube is we provide support for code reloading, which means that you can dynamically create the minimum code, data path code, that is required to process your data. So once you have this rule, you inject in the kernel, only a few lines of code that are enough for taking care of this action. When the user adds something more complex, you update this code in the data plane in order to satisfy also the second action. So that in the end, you have always the minimum amount of code required for you to work, which means you are always going at the fastest speed. How can you do this? Okay, it's a little bit more complicated, but okay. So when we ask for a new feature, the control plane of your network function has to generate the data plane code that is required to support that feature. And then we inject that feature in parallel with the old firewall. So we have two firewalls, let's say in parallel, but one is working and the other is still in standby. And then, we attach some shared data structure like maps to both firewalls because maybe it's nice to start a new firewall without losing the state of the previous. And then once this is done, you basically, you move the pointer. So instead of sending the packets to the old firewall, you move it's just a very, very atomic and very fast action. You move the pointer to the new firewall so that the packets are starting to flow to the new firewall and the old firewall is still there, but does nothing. And then finally, you can delete the old firewall and then you have the new firewall running. And this is completely transparent from the user. From what the user perceives is that this is very fast. Finally, leveraging the Unix ecosystem. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So for instance, we have a routing protocols. Waga is very nice. We have a, a packet capture and analysis like Wireshark. This is very nice. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So what we did is that we can set up a service in what we call the shadow mode. When we enable the shadow mode, so this is a service in the normal mode, this is a service in the shadow mode, each port is duplicated. So we have this port, two ports in the router, each port is duplicated in a separate namespace where it's terminated. So we create a dedicated namespace for this device, in this case, a router. And here we have exactly the same ports that we have on the original device. And some selected traffic, not all the traffic, we can decide which kind of traffic is taken and duplicated also on this port and of course, reaches the network namespace where we can do whatever you want. Of course, we can support also the reverse traffic. Let's imagine you don't have Wireshark, but you have a Quagga here. You can generate routing messages. Routing messages are pushed here and then pushed on the physical wire. So this will allow to reuse most of the tools we have already in, in Linux, also in Polytube, without having to rewrite everything from scratch. So we validated this uh, uh, library uh, in uh, Kubernetes, and it was really uh, surprising to me, not because we, we made it, 
because I mean, we can do it. But the fact that we made it in less than two months. So basically we say, let's take the, those boxes like uh, load balancer, load uh, router, NAT. We have a lot of network function already written. And let's try to create the complete network support. So the CNI for Kubernetes using EBPF blocks. And we succeeded. And um, the speed is good. There is a slide later that presents the speed. But most important, uh, we succeeded in a very short uh, uh, time frame. And this is was really surprising for, for us. And by the way, it was really much clear for us to follow the, the path of a packet between uh, the different blocks. Uh, if you take a, a, a standard CNI for Kubernetes like uh, Seal, Romana, um, Calico, uh, you can see that you hope it works because it's not really easy to understand the path of a packet inside. With this, let's say, traditional mechanism with middle boxes, NAT, router, load balance, it's much easier. And it was also really uh, fast to do. Okay, so some numbers now. Some numbers, we compared a bridge um, running uh, in uh, Polycube uh, in two cases, PC mode and XDP mode, compared to traditional bridges like OBS and uh, uh, Linux bridge. You can see that the performance of our PCN bridge running in PC is definitely similar, a little bit better, honestly, to the other. The, bridge running in PC is much higher, so it's good. We compared another app like a load balancer, so IPVS, which is standard in Linux, cut run the eBPF um, load balancer from, from Facebook, and our load balancer again running in PC and XDP. And we can see that if you run in PC, we are better than uh, IPVS. If we run in XDP, we're better than Catran. Somebody will say, okay, but maybe Catran is richer in terms of functionalities. I agree, probably yes. Uh, our is a proof of concept, but it shows that we can go really fast. We talk about Kubernetes, just some numbers. We are here, the other network plugins are here. So not only it works, but it's really fast, okay? Um, then there can be some uh, differences uh, um, between the number of features that we support and so on, but those preliminary numbers, without going too much into details, means that Polycube uh, is a really nice framework also in, in, your, in order to achieve high performance. Frame, framework overhead. So we talk about uh, um, those small programs before and after uh, each network function, and we were curious about uh, the overhead that is introduced here. Honestly, if you have only one network function, the overhead is pretty small. So we took the SDP redirect that takes a packet from one interface and sent out on another, and we compared with the Polycube equivalent, which is symbol for water, and you know the numbers are pretty much equivalent. So the, the the performance loss is pretty negligible. And the same happens if you if you run in a PC mode. So to be honest, however, the difference becomes huger if you run a lot of network functions in a chain. So once you have one or two network functions, basically there is no difference. Once you go larger in terms of service chain, the difference becomes more uh, uh, substantial, as you can see in the graph. But we, we don't see, we don't expect service chain to be much longer, probably two, three, mm, it's, it's, uh, it's really enough. By the way, you can see also that each network function, so each cube can be split internally in a lot of uh, EBPF programs, which are called microcubes. The firewall that we have is really made this way. And in this case, there is no uh, overhead because uh, the uh, pre and post processor are just uh, before and after a network function, not inside the network function itself. So it's good. Project status. So we implement uh, more than 10 network functions, of course, proof of concept, but they are there, you can try and, and run. 
Uh, the source code uh, is available on uh, GitHub. Uh, the most uh, active contributors come from our university, from, uh, from Torino uh, in Italy. And uh, obviously, other contributions are, are welcome. By the way, the uh, source code uh, is released under Apache 2, so it's, it's pretty OK in terms of uh, license. So concluding remarks, Polycube is the first internal uh, framework for creating network functions uh, with the EBF. It enables the facilitates the creation of uh, complex network services and also network topologies. So not just a, a single box, but a, a set of boxes connected together. Um, it extends the EBPF programming model with uh, uh, abstraction, which are very handy for uh, network, uh, network functions. Um, it supports uh, dynamic optimization of those network functions that we call cubes uh, that can be dynamically injected, re-injected, and updated in order to be more optimized. And it also leverages the power of the Linux ecosystem in order to uh, avoid to re-implement everything from, from scratch. Performance are really good. Um, honestly, not the, the same level of uh, DPDK and so on, but this is completely another story because uh, you have to make a choice between EBPF and DPDK. But if you want to stay uh, in the Linux kernel, uh, performance of EBPF are good, a uh, performance of Polycube, given all the abstraction, abstraction that we did, are still very, very, very good. So just slightly uh, less than uh, vanilla EBPF. And uh, we validate it also in case of complex uh, cases, like uh, uh, a complex uh, plugin for Kubernetes, uh, and everything was definitely uh, OK. And I mean, it's available. You can try it yourself. This has finished my presentation. Uh, if you have any question, read it once. OK. Um, questions? Not seeing any in the queue. Let's see, unless I missed one. Um, while, while people are dreaming up questions, let me ask one to you. So um, the Catran comparison confused me a little bit. So because Catran is also a BPF, eBPF program and so is yours and you have your prologue epilogue overhead, like you said, which will add to the, to the cycles needed. So is, is really the benefit from the chaining and the sort of the continuation of the different functions? Is that why you're able to edge out Catran itself? No, Catran was simply chosen because we wanted to compare what we did with uh, some state of the art. And definitely we have a proof of concept load balancer and Catran is uh, uh, one of the top uh, load balancer around. So we wanted to compare there and see uh, if the performance we can reach uh, in our framework, which has the advantage of creating service chain. Because if you want to create just a simple network service, uh, um, there is no need for, for quality. But just if you want to create a, a, a chain uh, and then we want to compare uh, with the state of the art. So Catalan was an obvious choice, like uh, the other obvious choice that, that was a breach. Right, right, so I, okay, I got it. So you were just, you were saying that you can, you were proving that you could hit that kind of packets per second processing, including the, the overhead that you have to serve. service. Okay, got it. Uh, there's a question on the, on the chat. Uh, from part of what made complex service chaining drop performance a lot? Uh, simply because uh, um, before and after each network function, like a bridge, we had to create uh, some additional programs which facilitate the, the creation of the chain. Because you have a, a bridge and then you have something else. The bridge doesn't really know what is uh, after uh, him. Uh, so it can be a network interface, it can be another service. So we have to create those two modules, two tiny EVPF programs, which helps in redirecting the traffic the proper way. So uh, those two help two small programs create a little bit of overhead. If the chain is short, the overhead is pretty much negligible. But 
if the chain is becoming long, uh, because you have maybe six, seven, eight uh, services in chain in cascade, then the overhead becomes uh, more noticeable. So, I mean, we want to be fair. So <laughs> this is uh, the reason for this performance though. One more question was, uh, how are stateful functions like NAT implemented because of your service chain epilogue probably? Sorry, I didn't get the point. Could you... well, how, how are stateful functions? I guess the question is oh, since... Okay, okay yes, yeah, stateful functions are a little bit more complex because you have to uh, handle the state in the, in the EBPF. So, um, I mean, the usual stuff, we have to create some tables and then do connection tracking, everything in the BPF like other projects did. So um, there's nothing basically different from other projects in this respect. What is really different is that you can chain multiple uh, functions together. Uh, hello? Yep. Does it uh, hand raise? Uh, yes, I raised my hand. Magnet one, uh, go for it. I am magnet one? Okay. Uh, that's me, actually. <laughs> uh, hey, fool. It's, it's Jamal, sorry. It shows up the wrong ID there. Um, so, if I understand you correctly, you're concept of service chaining is uh, to, are you using map uh, programs, program maps, I'm sorry, for defining uh, the, 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 the components of a service, right? It's, it's a chain or it's a bunch of programs which uh, then um, it, it, the composition of that uh, chain of programs becomes your service, correct? Yes. This is uh, using what as uh, program maps, yeah? Yes. Are you finding that there's a lot of, uh, the control interface to BPF is not, uh, to maps in particular is not the most, uh, it's almost like it's an afterthought, to be honest. The idea of, um, uh, for, for example, everything is packet driven, right? So if you're trying to do map aging or, um, uh, ability to graciously age entries in a table. It's not uh, that trivial because the only thing you, you have to basically depend on either a user space application that constantly pulls when is as the tables grow bigger, you have a problem or a new packet arriving and then you somehow include your logic to check for these uh, schemes. Um, I, did you have to deal with any of these issues? No, because I mean, this is some, somehow orthogonal to the work that we did. So um, the F has some limitation, exactly what you did, uh, what you mentioned in, in the maps. Um, but the problem we wanted to solve is uh, how to create a cascade, um, a, a, a variable number of uh, uh, EDF programs that are cascaded one to the other. I, I think. Um, the, the most uh, interesting concept comes from one of the first slide uh, in which I created uh, uh, a complex network topology with the bridge or router and NAT and so on. So um, this is uh, the novelty of the framework, uh, uh, the composition of network function, not the single network function itself. Uh, and the second novelty is that when you try to create a network function, you are not just have to build uh, about data plane. You have to build about data control uh, uh, management plane. And uh, we greatly simplify the creation of the control uh, plane because um, the, the, what, there is no sub, such a concept in EBPF. There's just um, a split, uh, data plane. That's right, that's right. There's a, there's a lot of uh, constructs that are important for the control to data path manipulation that are uh, missing to me. To, to put it simply. Yes. Right. So we leverage uh, abstraction that are already in uh, uh, VCC in order to get access to maps and so on. 
and we create a new abstraction in order to create a service chain and to connect the multiple pieces together, like a fast, a slow, and control plane. Um, the REST API is automatically synthesized, so you, you, you don't have, as a programmer, you don't have to do anything. You just write your data model, young, and everything is created automatically and so on. So, but that doesn't include creating the data path component. No, you, data plan is okay. so you still have to write it by hand. Yes, but if you want to create a network service, probably you're interested in the, in the data plan. So it is exactly what you want to do. to do. What you don't want to do is bother about REST API. What about the REST API? So we simplify the task and the connection between one, uh, one, one function to the other. Okay, thanks. I can talk to you offline or maybe during the happy hour. <laughs>